Good morning. Welcome back everybody and I'm going to have something a little different for you guys, namely because I am not going to be here on Saturday. I will be traveling this weekend so not going to be here at the hangar to help out and do any of the, the maintenance work. So not wanting to disappoint you guys, I got a little something and this is due to a recent request that I saw in the comments on can I help explain what goes on when we start the engines? And could I elaborate on the cartridge start mode that is a unique feature of the Air Force versions? Because the, as far as I'm aware, the Navy and Marine Corps versions never had that capability. They always relied on the pneumatic start using a start cart uh, of some flavor. And to go along with that, they never had a battery either to my knowledge. So I'll cover a little more details on that later in the video, but so yes, we are going to explore what it takes to get a J79 uh, started up and I will cover both modes of operation today. All right, our first method of starting, and this is always the primary method of starting a F4, was using a start cart, just like our Dash 60 here. This is very common. Also could be used with, would be the older MA1A, which literally was just a start cart on wheels. It had no capability of providing electrical power. The Dash 60 expanded on that idea. And not only do you get start air, but you also got electrical power. And then to further complicate matters, we have the Dash 60 Bravo version. And the only big difference here is, you notice how we have a panel missing right here that older Dash 60s would have had a panel right here. All right, so on the engine itself, the engine is right back here. And this, this area right here is the air intake. You can see that where my finger is. That's where the fresh air comes into the engine gets compressed and goes out through the burner and there's the exhaust pipe back there. Um, so on the nose of the engine, this big yellow guy right here, that's the actual generator itself. This is what provides AC electrical power to the aircraft. So the Dash 60 expanded on the idea of just having a cart just for getting the engine spun up, but it also gave you electrical power. And older Dash 60s had another generator here and this would provide DC power to older aircraft. That, with, the, with the Bravo series of Dash 60s, that capability was taken out. All right, so the exhaust for the engine is pretty prominent. It's this silver box right up here. And that's all the hot, hot exhaust gas comes right out of there. Now this lid has to be latched open. There is a safety switch built into it. So unless that lid is latched open, you can't start the engine. Now. The air intake on these carts is not very obvious because the top is completely covered just so it doesn't get rained in. And there's no other doors here, but we got this little box-like structure right here. And this is the actual air intake for the engine through that screen guard so it doesn't suck in any sort of debris or rocks or anything like that. But this is where the engine gets its air from. All right, so that air comes through here and ends up coming into the engine into that downpipe right there goes through the compressor and comes this direction right here this is the actual burner of the engine this is what provides it its its rotational for energy and right in between the compressor and the burner we got this little pipe like structure here with a big valve this is going out the top of this cart to the air hose so that is the air source for starting an engine, whether it's a J79 on a F4 Phantom or any other aircraft that takes start air. This is where that air is coming from. It's just literally coming off the compressor of the engine. And whenever you enable that, you're taking some of that compressed air that would go through the burner. So the burner actually runs a little harder just to keep the governed speed where it needs to be. And the air coming out of this is pretty hot and it comes out at about ideally between 40 and 45 psi so it's not a lot of pressure but it is an awful lot of air there's a lot of flow to it and that's what the engine needs in order to get started all 
All right, so that air enters in on a connection on each engine. You got one on the right-hand side here. And you got another set of doors on the left-hand engine. Now, these are identical otherwise, so I'm just gonna sit here and focus on the right engine because that's where my light is. Now, this is one of the differences, as I understand it, uh, between the Navy and Marine Corps jets versus the Air Force uh, jets, is Navy and Marines had one access door, and they had a changeover valve uh, to send that start air to the left or right engine, depending on which, uh, which engine was being started. The Air Force, you have two sets of access doors, and you have to move the hose from one engine to the other in order to start it. That's as far as I understand it. And I don't know what the logic is there other than just having, just not having to crawl underneath the jet so much on a carrier deck. I'm not sure. If you guys know the answer, please put it below. I'd love learning this kind of stuff. All right, so what we're looking at here is, this is the actual starter unit itself. So you can see this is where the start air would come in through this connection makes a right hand turn and, and there's this duct which goes into the turbine starter which uh, as soon as you start moving air through it, it starts spinning. There's a shaft that goes up to the nose of the engine where the generator sits and spins the engine directly there. So air comes in, spins it, gets the engine turning and then all the, once the air is used by the uh, turbine starter here, it comes out of this exhaust port and goes overboard. All right, now let's look at a normal startup. So we got the start card already connected. We got electrical power running. Now on command from the pilot, we will hit the switch that sends the air uh, down the hose to get the engine spinning over. Now, at that point, the pilot is watching the RPM gauge in the cockpit and at a minimum of 10% RPM, that is the earliest that you can do this, uh, you hit the igniter button on the back of the throttle and then bring the throttle forward out of cutoff. That also introduces fuel into the combustors and with the igniter running it should light the fuel pretty quickly. Now the igniters themselves are very similar to automotive spark plugs, they're just purpose built for being inside a jet engine. And in this case, they actually run a lot hotter using higher voltage and a little bit more energy than an automotive spark plug. Jet fuel is far less volatile than gasoline is and is a lot harder to ignite. But once it's lit, it'll keep burning. Pilot at this point is monitoring the temperatures in the RPM rise. Now, even though the engine's lit, that doesn't mean we shut off the air hose. What we're waiting for, or what the pilot is waiting for, is 45% RPM. And at that point, he will signal us to shut off the air hose. So at, at a minimum of 10%, you can light the engine and it's self-sustaining. But you have to keep the starter in until a minimum of 45%. And then, you can, then the engine is okay to accelerate on its own to 65%, which is idle RPM on a J79. Now one of the last things that the pilot is looking for also is that the utility pressure on the number two engine is at 2750 PSI because the utility pumps on each engine, it's a shared system. So that's why we always start engine two first is because its pressure is set slightly lower than that of number one. All right, so after engine two is started, the ground crew would then disconnect the hose from engine two, move that over to engine one, and then secure the doors for engine two, the, and then repeat the process. Now, as engine one got started up, what the pilot is looking for amongst all the other readings is making sure that utility pressure has increased from 2750 up to 3000 PSI, because remember, the utility pumps are set at different pressures, uh, but only at idle. And uh, again, that, that's to prevent them from resonating or fighting each other. And two, that allows them to, again, allows the flight crew to verify that both pumps are operating. Now, as I understand it, this idea was carried into the F-15, uh, the Eagle, because that was another one of McDonnell Douglas's uh, products. And both the left and right engine on that shares the utility system, as I understand it, on that aircraft. 
All right, now we move on to cartridge starts, and this was a unique capability for Air Force birds, uh, mostly for the scramble start capability. These things could help start the engine up pretty darn fast because it is a very potent source of, uh, of air for that starter turbine and would get that engine sped up even faster than a pneumatic start could. However, it comes at a cost. You can only use so many of those cartridges before the turbine starter needs to get cleaned because it's literally a pyrotechnic charge generating a lot of hot gas. And there were, you end up with three results from, or four I should say, you end up with four results from a cartridge start. Ideally, the cartridge would fire, generate its hot gas, they only burn for a little under 20 seconds, and it would get the engine fire, uh, spun up to speed so they could crank up and get the engine started. Um, the you had a couple of failure modes, uh, one of which was a like a hang start where the cartridge would ignite but it would not burn very well so it wouldn't burn, uh, it, it would not generate a lot of that hot gas that the starter needs and it would sometimes just smolder or just generate a little bit of gas and, but not enough to help get the engine up to speed. Uh, another failure mode was they just didn't light. That was pretty bad having a misfired cartridge and what they could do and that's per the manual that I was just reading is they could attempt they could remove it check it reinsert it and then make sure that the electrical cable was seated properly and try one more time if it didn't light that cartridge needed to get disposed of safely and the last result is as I understand it is the cartridge would burn, but burn very vigorously, and had the tendency, it had the possibility of starting a fire because flames would start shooting out of the exhaust port on the starter duct. And crew chief Al has mentioned that is kind of excitable because then the crew needs to shut everything down and evac out of the aircraft. The jet could carry. Uh, unfired cartridges they had to go in their own door to do this safely and you had you had a door near the leading edge root of each wing and that is this door right here on the left side of the aircraft and there's a corresponding door over on the right it could only carry one cartridge because these things are about the size of a coffee can now the cartridge gets seated in this large socket that's off the side of the turbine starter. And again, unique capability for the Air Force birds. So the cartridge would get seated in there. This is the electrical cable that would fire the cartridge. All right, so once the cartridge was seated and connected, the pilot could then use the cranking switch on the throttle panel, and that would initiate cartridge ignition to get the turbine to start spinning and get the engine cranked up. I have visibility on this right now because this maintenance door is actually open right now. Normally this would be closed. Everything would be accessed through the auxiliary air door and in, especially with these uh, strut braces installed to keep this door from slamming shut. The Everything would be done up through that size of an opening. All right, so once the cartridges were done and the engine was started, uh, using some heavy gloves, the ground crew would then come over, disconnect, and take the cartridge out, and then go take and go dispose of the spent cartridge. Now, over here, you see a deflector door for the, um, for the starter outlet. And to my knowledge, this was an Air Force feature. I'm not sure if the Navy and Marine Corps uh, Phantoms had this had this deflector door. I may be wrong on that. I'm not 100% certain. But this deflector door made sure that a lot of the spent hot gases and smoke got deflected overboard. And from what Crew Chief Al has said, it is an awful lot of smoke. And it tended to make quite a mess when they function normally. Now I'm going to leave a link down below and as well as I think up here 
to a video that was uh, uh, that shows a German Air Force, so a Luftwaffe Phantom, using a cartridge in order to start, and uh, it's really cool to see. And, and the sound that you hear too of the uh, the cartridge igniting and spinning up that starter really fast, it's really unique and it's really interesting. So go check that out after you guys get done watching this one because that's that's really cool. And yes, it is an awful lot of smoke that comes out of those cartridges. All right, guys, hope you guys enjoyed that. I will definitely be back next weekend uh, to continue on our efforts of getting this lady back in the sky. So until next time, thank you for watching.